Hey there everybody, it's Nathan Cool with NathanCoolPhoto.com and in this episode I want to address one of the most commonly asked but most often confusing questions concerning real estate photography and that's what to charge. So it's a common question that gets asked because sometimes it's a hard piece of information to find and when you think you might have the answer to that for your region and the type of work you're doing, you might be underselling yourself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to address this in a few different parts. First, I'm going to talk about some of the basic principles to this. Then I'm going to be talking about a primary goal that you should be achieving with this. And then I'm going to actually run through a three-point calculation here to figure this out on what you need to charge. And then I'm going to follow that up by how to make even more money on each one of your shoots. So let's start out first though talking about some of the basic principles that apply to charging for real estate photography. So the first principle that is so often overlooked by not just new real estate photographers, but sometimes also by seasoned real estate photographers is you don't want to establish your prices based off of cheap clients. And there's a lot of them out there because as you may know from prior videos that I've talked about this, where statistics show that about 80% of all real estate agents don't even last two years. So you don't want to be wasting your time on that. You want to be able to target the good ones. Now that's the marketing approach, but it applies also to the pricing that you want to establish. Remember, if you're doing real estate photography as a business, you want a sustainable business, something that's going to be long lasting. And you can't create a sustainable business by targeting non-sustainable clients. That's principle number two. It ties in with number one that yes, we need to establish pricing based off of a sustainable market, but you just can't be chasing these low end type of clients thinking that, oh, well, I'll be able to get their work. You want to be able to target something that is sustainable. So before calculating your prices and thinking, no, oh, I've done my due diligence. This is all I can charge. I guarantee you, you're probably wrong. In fact, the biggest principle here that is often overlooked, number three, which ties into all that, is that you can't charge what your competitors are charging. Immediately you might think, well, I've got to go less. Wrong. You need to go higher. The fact is, if you have been able to do due diligence and find out what other real estate photographers are charging, it's probably because their pricing information is readily available. And it's readily available more often than not because they want to be able to attract that as their selling point. So they'll list it on their website, they'll promote that as their advantage. But that's not the advantage that you want for a sustainable business. One, it doesn't bring in enough money to keep you going year after year after year. But once again, going back to principles one and two, it's going to be attracting the wrong audience. So when you find out what your competitors are charging, you should be charging and calculate that to be about 10 to 20 percent more more easily. And immediately you may think, well, who's going to be hiring me for this? Well, the ones that really appreciate your work. And here's the key to this principle is that if you aren't better than your competitors, you can't charge more than they do. But if you are better than they are, then you can charge more than what they offer. And this leads to the fourth principle before getting on to the goals, and that's that you need to charge what your worth. Now, you might think, well, I do such a great job with photography, I should be charging Rembrandt type prices. Well, you have to be reasonable with it, but so many photographers undersell themselves and they do it by getting so downtrodden, disheartened by looking at these prices of these photo mills and say, we'll go out and shoot a hundred pictures for a hundred bucks, you know, and stuff that just as well, it's a hundred dollars worth of crap a lot of the times. So you want to target once again, these sustainable sustainable agents, the sustainable clients, they will pay you more. Know that when you're finding prices from your competitors, they're probably likely listed low because of their, their type of work that they're doing, which is high quantity, not high quality. So bear that in mind as then we move into the goal and the primary goal that we want to achieve establishing these prices. The primary goal with establishing prices for real estate photography 
falls along the lines of what you want to do to conduct your business, and that's that you want to have fewer high paying gigs than a large quantity of low paying gigs. I've said this before through other videos, I'd rather have one $500 gig than five $100 gigs. I don't want to be driving all over the place. I'd rather just show up once and be able to do a shoot and make more money. Now, after we calculate the pricing, I'm going to touch on this, but a little look ahead. What that also means is it's not just charging for the photos themselves, but also with other add-ons and what you do when you make one trip to a location and how much money you can get out of that gig. It's much better to just drive to one place, charge what you can and as much as you can for all the work you do than driving all over the place. We'll touch on that again, but once I, before we do, I wanna now try to cover with you all the steps that would be necessary to do your pricing. In fact, most of this is done with three basic primary steps to do the calculation. There's a lot of other things that you can delve into for overhead and cost and whatnot. And those things, by the way, I break down in my book on business techniques for real estate photography. And I do have a link to that and other pertinent information down in the description for this video. Also included with that is a video that I posted recently on real estate photography trends for 2022 and in that is some pricing and we're going to touch on that next as I cover some of these pricing calculations so that you can now figure out how much you should be charging for your real estate photography. So establishing your prices is three basic steps to the calculation. I'm going to cover those, also then the example to put that together, and then follow that up with how to even increase your value and more money getting out of each one of those gigs. But the three steps to calculating this out is to first decide how much money you want to make a year. It's so often overlooked. So many photographers leave that out. Some get a little greedy. Some undervalue themselves. So you can't say, well, I want to make a million dollars a year as a photographer. Well, if you're Peter Lick and you sell some of your art online, well, yeah, you can do that. Real estate photography, it's very unlikely you'll make a million, but you can definitely make a good income. Setting your goals to something reasonable for an income in your area is most important. If you want to decide to do this as a full-time job like I do, or a part-time job, which I used to do, and there's nothing wrong with either way. I used to be an engineer, as you know, for many years and I did real estate photography and other photography part-time until eventually I was making enough to where it's like I have to give up one of my careers. I don't have enough time and I'm so glad that I went to real estate photography full-time and I'm making now more than I was as an engineer. Granted, I am in California. It is a higher paying market. But let's just take some numbers. We're going to use that during our calculations when we get down to the example. But if you want to make 50 grand, 80 grand, 100 grand a year, or even 150 grand a year, these aren't unattainable goals doing real estate photography. Because unlike doing weddings and other genres of photography, this is a business to business type of venture with repeat work. Now, there's a lot of other add ons you can add, put in there, and there's other things we can get to and going to cover some of that here in a little bit. But that's the first thing is within reason, come up with a number that you feel would justify you pursuing this career. Once you have that established, then the rest of this will fall into play. But that is the first important variable to the calculation. The next is then figuring out what your competitors are charging. Now, this takes research. It takes some due diligence. And once again, link to the uh, video on photography trends, including the report and survey that shows some of those prices. But you most often will find in a lot of areas that kind of an average uh, photo shoot for a listing, an MLS type of listing, it would be about $200, but that's even on the low side. That's kind of nationwide throughout the US and also from participants uh, from other countries on the last couple years of our photography survey. So you can charge a lot more also for other shoots. If you know, you've been shooting for a long time, a lot of the participants in the survey showed that anywhere from five years, 10 years or 10 years and greater, that 
group was anywhere from 250 to 500 for an average shoot. And then of course, a lot of new photographers coming into this would charge a lot less, thinking that's what would give them the competitive edge, but it doesn't, it just undersells you. And after a while, you'll realize you do need to charge more. So that's why, as I was mentioning earlier, is that when you find out what your competitors make, add 10% to 20% on top of that. And you do that because you are better. If you're not, and you don't have that standard of quality high enough yet, then you need to take a step back. You're not at the level yet, and a part of your career as a real estate photographer, where you need to start establishing prices, you need more work. So that's either working with an established photographer, or if you have someone who is a friend who's a real estate agent, and you can work with them a little bit, and it also takes some more training, learn a little bit more about your craft. Uh, myself, Rich Baum, uh, Brian Berkowitz, a lot of us also provide coaching and I provide also, you know, the real estate photography series, books and all that. So there's things that if you're not really good enough, you're really not going to compete quality wise then you can't raise your prices above your competitors. And that means that you're at the point where you shouldn't be doing that yet. Take a step back. But if you are and you're good, you need to charge for it. So increase that rate by a good 20%. The third item in there is also very critical. And this is how many shoots you can then do a year and how many you would have to do to reach that goal. And that's all there is to it. There's just those three steps. It's a matter of figuring out what you wanna make, what you can charge, and then how many shoots it would take to do that and are you willing to put in that much work. So now let's work through an example to put all this together with some realistic numbers. So let's start out with a reasonable goal of $100,000 a year. And you might be saying, there's no way I could make that if I'm in Indiana, Iowa, or some of these other lower real estate paying markets, but you'd be surprised. Anyways, let's just use that as kind of a rough estimate. Um, and that's what I call before gas and gear. It's just, you know, some overhead might be on top of that, might be below it. Let's just use this as a rounded number. Now let's also say that you want to work just 10 months out of the year. And that's usually good for a peak season, gives you two months off for some vacations, holidays, some of the slow season. So let's say that if you were doing $100,000 a year, 10 months out of the year, that's $10,000 a month. Now, if you were to have found that your competitors are charging $200 a shoot, then you should probably charge 250 a shoot. That comes down to about 10 gigs a week or about two gigs a day working Monday through Friday. And if you figure that that's about four hours of shooting with, let's say it's two hours for each gig, then there's two hours of editing for each gig. So you've got four hours of shooting, four hours of editing, you've got an eight hour day. And that isn't that unreasonable, an eight hour day, which charging then $500 a day gives you that 2,500 a week. And of course then gives you that $10,000 a month and $100,000 a year. So you can see it's not that difficult really to make a six figure income doing real estate photography. Now I know, and I do realize there are markets that will undersell you like crazy. Uh, even in Florida where prices of real estate are fairly high, especially along some of the coastal regions, I'll get a lot of feedback from other photographers, some that I train, and they're telling me, you know, they're being undercut by HDR photographers they are charging $100, $150. Well, once again, going back to if you're good, and if you're really good, then you can charge more. And that's how you can get one of the most value priced increases out of your work is being the best. So if you can prove to other real estate agents in your area that you are worth paying more money for, they will pay you more money. So sure, you can find these HDR photographers that might be 100, 150 bucks. But when a real estate agent, the really smart ones, not the 80% that are gonna be here today, gone tomorrow, not even last two years, but the 20%, 13%, maybe even the top 10%, the ones that know the value, they will pay more for really good photography if you can prove to them that's what you do. You have to bring more value to the table to be able to charge a higher price because you are giving them a higher value.
And another way to get more money out of each one of your gigs, something I mentioned just a little bit ago, was that you put in more low effort, high cost add-ons. It's an easy way to get this. You go to a restaurant and you order whatever meal, as soon as you order something to drink, it's gonna be ridiculously priced. You go into most restaurants and you order an iced tea which costs them 10 cents, they're gonna charge you two, three, four, five bucks for it. Or you know, you go in, you get a beer, something you could you know, maybe cost you 50, 75 cents and they're gonna charge you 10 bucks. So it's those add-ons, all businesses do this. So you think about, here's a real low cost one, super easy to get into floor plans. So you don't need photography skills to do floor plans. You go to Cuba Casa, download their app, costs you about 35 bucks to do a floor plan, charge 100 and 150 bucks for it. So easy, easy add-on type stuff. Video, you might be going to yourself, oh, I don't know how to do video. I gotta get a gimbal, I gotta get a special camera. These things aren't that high cost for most video tour type of videos that you do for real estate, they're really not that hard. I can do most 3,000, 3,500 square foot homes in about 30 to 45 minutes on site. Once you get good with video walkthroughs, you can do them very quickly. So also, by the way, you know, I have a book on doing the basic videography for real estate, link that also in the description for this video, show you how to do the majority of what would be needed for these type of real estate video tours and they're easy to upsell as an expensive add-on and it doesn't take that much more effort. Also, the uh, virtual tours. You know, recently I was talking about the Tricio Light 2. It's a one and done. Uh, you just do the, you set it up, you, it does its own JPEG with some of the best HDR I've seen out of a portable camera. Boom, it's done. Even so, even if you had a Z1 or something else, you don't need a Matterport. You can use cloud panel and whatnot. And once again, yeah, I've got a book on virtual tours also. But the fact is, is that there's a lot of ways to do inexpensive, budget-friendly virtual tours that won't take that much effort. Sure, you can make high-end virtual tours using a DSLR or mirrorless camera. I show how to do that in other videos. And I do that for businesses and for some high-end real estate stuff. But for the majority, majority of what MLS work you would need to do, they only need that temporary asset for a few weeks as they're selling the home. So you can once again have a low effort, high cost add-on into your offerings. So there's other things like that that you can do. And once again though too, adding this value of being able to provide all these various services, then you'll get more gigs because you'll be the go-to photographer. Oh yeah, well, you know, uh, Nancy over here or Joe over here, the, whoever the photographer is, it's like, oh, well, just call them. Of course, well, we need a virtual tour on top of that. They, they, they do everything. So you'll get the majority of the calls. If you don't provide those services, then you won't get as many. But that's an easy way though to add on value to each one of your gigs. Another one, which I recommend, and I get flack from this from photographers by saying this, and you know I've got a video on it, is do your own editing. If you outsource your editing, you may be undercutting yourself. Now, there can come a point where you've grown your real estate photography business so big that you need to outsource your editing. But the fact is, if you do to be, you need to do that to make enough money, it could be because you have a high volume type of business, not a high value and high then income type of business. So if you need to increase your volume to make enough money, you need to go back to those calculations. There's something wrong here. If you're just yourself doing this and you need to outsource your editing, I'm glad that you've got so many gigs that are keeping you busy, but you're running a treadmill and you're, you're losing so much at the same time. It's highly inefficient to pay an editor just because you're getting low pay gigs at the same time. Now, if you're getting a lot of high paying gigs, then that's different and to have an editor. But at that point too, now you're making enough money with high paying gigs to really think about insourcing some of that editing, possibly hiring on another photographer who can help you fill in some of these gigs and also do the editing as well. But I strongly encourage everyone to do your own editing. It'll also make you speed up your shooting. You'll become more efficient and better at shooting. And of course, then that'll reduce the amount of time and effort that you have to do in editing. So definitely consider do your own editing, outsource only when as a large business you get to that point, but not as a sole proprietor. 
sole proprietor on just one, two of you working together to do your photography. Another one that's often overlooked on getting more money per gig is to keep your gear budget in check. If, if you follow, like I do, all these different photography digital magazines that are online, different photography blogs, all this, they're going to tell you as soon as, hey, the new Sigma 20 millimeter came out. Oh, we've got the new Z62, the new Z9, the Alpha 1 came out by Sony. You need to get this new greatest latest camera because it will just change the world. Well, uh, recently, in fact, uh, I have a video that, that showed you don't need to do that. There's some real budget friendly stuff, even if you wanted to go mirrorless. But recently, here's a great example. I needed to upgrade because I've got such a high shutter count on my interior camera, the body that I was currently using. It was a Nikon D610. And how did it get up to over 100,000 shutter counts? Well, that only happened in less than a year. So I constantly are going through these. Now, what did I replace it with? Well, another Nikon D610 with that Takina 16 to 28 F2.8. And why did I do that? And you might be going, why didn't you go mirrorless? Well, because all in for everything was about 1800 bucks with tax and shipping. That's all it was for the setup that makes me my income every year. So you don't need to go out and spend a lot of money and say, oh, I need to go out and buy a $2,500 camera, I need to buy a $1,500 lens, and then multiply that times two because you need to have backups. So instead of spending $10,000 on gear, including the backups, I can spend about 3,600, maybe $4,000. So a fraction of the cost. So remember, it's real estate photography. It does need to be high quality, but you don't need to have eye focus. You don't need to have a burst count of 20 frames per second. You know, we're not doing this high speed stuff. And you also don't need to have your interior exterior photography stills camera do video. Keep that separate. And there are great cameras that do video for a lot less. Take, for instance, the, the Lumix GH5S or the GH5. Those are things I talk about in the videography book. You get into the micro four thirds realm, they're plenty fine, plenty well enough to do real estate video. Topic for another time, covered in other videos. Links to those also in the description for this video. But anyways, I hope this gives you a lot more insight on how to do pricing for real estate photography and to keep it in check. And best of all, don't undersell your Yourself. You're probably a lot better than you realize and people will pay for the quality that you can provide. It's just that not everybody out there is willing to spend money and those aren't the clients that you want to attract. Anyways, I hope this video was useful for you. I hope that you can apply some of this to your photography as well. If you did like this video and you want to see more, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. It won't cost anything. And as soon as one of these videos is posted, you'll be the first to know. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, take care, be safe, and get out there and shoot something.